Hello, everyone. Hi. It's great to see you. So um, it's my great pleasure on behalf of Macmillan Education to introduce um, Sarah to you all. She's um, uh, an ELT consultant and teacher trainer based in Buenos Aires in Argentina, um, a young learner specialist, and Sarah has written uh, lots of materials for us um, at uh, Macmillan. And he's also a tutor on the Teaching English in Pre-Primary Education online course with our teacher training partners at Nile. So Sarah is very much a part of the family here. And today she's going to share the secret ingredients uh, uh, that go into making a thriving, positive classroom. So Sarah, welcome and over to you. Thank you. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Mike. I'm happy to be part of the family. Um, so yes, I'm checking in from a very terribly stormy Buenos Aires. Um, I think it's the terrible, the worst weather we've had this summer. So hopefully our connection will resist. Um, hi everybody from all around the world. I'm very grateful for having you all here. Um, we have four, more than 400 participants at this moment in time and numbers are going up. So that is fantastic. And that is already a positive thing. And this webinar is all about being positive. So uh, thank you very much for being here. And I hope this webinar will be uh, impacting positively on your teaching and your learners learning process. So I would like to begin um, by reading out a recipe for a happy class. And this was created by an 11-year-old named David. It says, my recipe for a happy class. Ingredients, one pinch of sharing, half a cup of confidence, one tablespoon of enjoyment, six teaspoons of cheerfulness, five ounces of communication, half a kilogram of good looks, 250 grams of cooperation, 10 grams of behavior, one kilogram of discipline, one really nice teacher, grated, 500 ml of kindness. Now the method, mix the confidence, the communication and cooperation together in a large bowl. Add the enjoyment, the cheerfulness and the good looks to the mixture. Beat together the behavior, the discipline, and add to the mixture. Bake the cake at 200 in a round tin, 15 centimeters deep and 45 centimeters in diameter for one week. Once the cake is baked, take it out of the oven and sprinkle the teacher on top. The cake makes 10 helpings. David, aged 11. Robert Fisher asked a group of 11 year olds to use the metaphor of a recipe to write about a happy class. So this is what David wrote. And we might be struck by the insights of this 11 year old into what constitutes a happy classroom or a positive classroom. Um, the characteristics he's chosen have got to do with those that we value in teachers of young, young learners, sharing, confidence, enjoyment, cheerfulness, um, cooperation. He has even thought about the, the weighting that he's given to all these ingredients. And he looks at classroom management, about behavior, discipline, communication. He even wants one kilo of discipline, because that's really important, isn't it? Um, and it's interesting to see how he would grate the teacher, who has to be very nice, but he would grate the teacher and sprinkle the teacher on top so everyone can get the teacher's attention at all times. So let's have a look at what we're going to be doing today. We're going to be looking at what a positive classroom is, and I think that David has actually given us quite a lot of insights into what a positive classroom is. What a positive classroom is not, we need to make that distinction. We're gonna be reflecting a lot throughout the session. I think that reflection is the way in which we can see what we're doing and find a way to improve. So there's gonna be a lot of reflection 
at each section of this webinar. So I hope you are open-minded to have a look at your practice and, and uh, pinpoint where you would like to improve and find ways to do so. Um, why do we want a positive classroom? It sounds like a, quite a silly question, doesn't it? Who would say they don't want a positive classroom? <laughs> I believe we all should want a positive classroom. But um, let's have a look at exactly why we do want to create that and why we need to make an effort to do that. It doesn't just come alone. It does take time. It does take persistence. We're going to look at four ingredients that go into a positive classroom within that those four ingredients, we're going to look at lots of teacher tips, lots of practical ideas. This is the practical part of this webinar. And we're going to end up with our end reflection to start building our positive classroom or continue creating that positive classroom that you probably already have. So David has already told us what a positive classroom is, at least from the point of view of an 11 year old. He has given us those lovely positive words. But what is not a positive classroom? So I'm not going to ask you what a positive classroom is because David has told us, but what is not a positive classroom? Could you write in the chat box what you believe a negative classroom is, a destructive classroom, a classroom that is not conducive to learning, um, characteristics, attitudes that you believe go into a classroom that is not positive. Bullying, boredom, chaos, disrespect, boring, threatening, ag aggression, stress. Passive, demotivation, humiliation, distractions. Yes, good. So this is what we don't want, of course. So it's obvious why we would want a positive classroom, but we, of course we don't want a negative one. But there are so many threats out there, so many threats. And unfortunately, in the process of learning, threats, or negative effects can really outweigh the positive effects. Once there is a negative effect in there, it's really difficult to get the positive to outweigh it. So we really want to go against those threats and we need an arsenal of strategies to go against those negative effects and those, those threats that we have. Um, but now I'm going to give you some bad news. This is the negative moment of this webinar. The rest of the webinar is going to be very positive, but this is the negative moment of this webinar. And I've got to give you some bad news. I'm sorry to say many times we are our own threat. We want our children, our students, our learners to be respectful yet we use language that is not respectful sometimes. We want our learners to be responsible, to be independent, yet we use language that implies teacher ownership. We want our students to behave very well because it's the right thing to do. But then we use language and our own attitudes that don't match that value. We want our learners to have good relationships, but then we humiliate when we get frustrated or we use sarcasm when we get frustrated. So many times we are our own threat. Of course, there are threats that come from the outside. There are threats that we cannot control things that happen at home, things that are happening to these uh, learners that are not happening within the classroom boundaries. They come with that from the outside, but we still have to try and deal with all that. We are the ones in the classroom who have got the biggest control to try and see what's happening and try and outweigh those negative effects and bring in those positive effects. Sometimes stress, can be very hurtful. 
And it may just come from one tiny negative comment from a peer, or it may be a test, and that creates a lot of stress. So we need to see how we can bring that stress down and try to bring out all that positive that we can. It's our responsibility to do that. Let's not be our own threat. Let's see what we can do. Now, when we look at positive classrooms, David calls it a happy classroom. But there are different ways of talking about this. It's a very broad construct, which is quite difficult to define sometimes. And sometimes we talk about a general feeling, a general atmosphere or vibe that is in our classroom. And that is either positive or negative, and it's just the feeling that we get. So many times, it can become quite vague. What is actually positive classroom climate or community or environment or a culture or an atmosphere? It can become vague because it's just a feeling or a vibe that we get. So the main aim of this webinar is to give you the practical ideas. What can we do exactly to create this positive environment? Now, the words community and culture do make a little bit of a difference from the other words that we have on the screen. Um, a positive classroom is felt by us or by our students, and it will be felt individually everyone will feel something different, hopefully all positive, but in different ways. But community or culture means that it's a collaborative feeling. And that's where we want to go. We want something that is collaborative because we want to all work towards this positive feeling. So it's not just the teacher doing it. It's not just one student doing it. We want to work collaboratively in this. We need connectedness for a positive classroom to work. Um, another word we can use for positive classroom is a BAM classroom. Um, so we can add that to our list of similar words to a positive classroom, a BAM classroom. This was coined by Baruti Kafel. Baruti Kafel um, is a school headmaster and consultant and um, he goes into classrooms all the time. And he talks about the feeling that he gets when he walks into a classroom. That is the most important thing. When he walks into a classroom, what does he feel? Are the students working collaboratively? Is there a feeling of well-being? Are they comfortable? Are they positive? That feeling that he gets when he walks into the classroom. So I would like to know if you think, if imagine Baruti Kafel walks into your classroom, what would he think about that? What feeling would he get if he walked into your classroom? He wants a BAM classroom, that classroom that is positive, where everyone is motivated, that is magical. That is BAM, Vanessa. <laughs> uh, um, so if the, if, uh, Baruti Kafel walks into your classroom. What would he feel? Would he feel it's a banned classroom? Okay, it depends on the lesson. Okay. Um, okay, not always. All right. Hope so. Good. Yes, my classes are always banned. We've got someone there, Amanda. Good, sometimes, okay. Um, I want that, a BAM classroom, fantastic. Okay, that's where we want to go today. Let's find ways to get a BAM classroom. Um, if you search for Baruti Kafel on YouTube, you will see some videos of him talking about what a BAM classroom is, and I'm sure he'll motivate you to have one. Um, so, um, the idea would be to think about that. What is the feeling that someone gets when they walk into your classroom? It could be Baruti Kafel, but it could be a parent. It could be a colleague. It could be your head. Um, what would they feel when they walk into the classroom? We want to know what an outsider would feel when they come into the classroom. What would they see? What would they hear? How would they feel? And that will probably also show us how our students 
feel. We can always ask them, of course, to know how they feel, but um, this is a way of reflecting. What do you think that outsiders see or hear or feel when they come into your classroom? So when we talk about uh, why we want a positive classroom, would anyone here say they don't want a positive classroom? Probably not. I think we all do want a positive classroom, don't we? Um, and we tend to say positive classrooms bring, bring positive results. And I mean, it's, it's, it's quite obvious really, isn't it? Um, but in what terms do we get positive results? Um, what are positive results? Well, everything we want to achieve in the classroom is a positive result. We could be talking about social and social and emotional development. If we achieve that, then we're getting positive results. And I'm sure a positive classroom does bring positive results in social and emotional development. Um, we want our students to learn to be kind and respectful and take risks and uh, be okay with challenges and making mistakes is all right. That's all positive classroom and that is all social and emotional. Um, but of course, Christina says learning acquisition is enhanced because of all this, because children are more receptive to learning, because children are more ready to take risks. That is why learning acquisition is enhanced. Yes, um, we get positive results in terms of academic achievement as well. So it's an all rounder. We gain from wherever you look at this, whatever you're looking at, whatever your aim is, you're going to, look, you're going to earn something from that because you've got a positive classroom. Um, We've got someone here saying, I used to have a classroom with 42 students during 30 years of teaching, and now I'm teaching in an academy. It's very easy to have a BAM class. Wow, good for you, fantastic. I'm glad about that. Um, so let's have a look at the ingredients that go into a positive classroom. So let's see how exactly we can do this. Right, yes, a positive classroom leads the learners to achieve the set goals. That's exactly the reason. So um, any goals that you have will be achieved if you have a positive classroom. So getting a positive classroom is an investment. We need to start by achieving that positive classroom and then everything else will result fine. But if we don't start with a positive classroom, then the rest might not come either. So we need to be looking at the positive classroom. That's the first thing we need to be looking at. So we've got these four ingredients. Would you like to see what these four ingredients are? Yes, good, okay. I'm basing this webinar on this framework, but you have lots of different frameworks out there that you could have a look at if you wanted to. Um, I chose this one. This one has four ingredients, which involves physical environment, time and instructional management, behavior management, and teacher effectiveness. When all these work together, and all these four ingredients are positive, we will achieve those positive results that we're expecting, hopefully. Let's have a look at how we do this. And many of the examples I'm going to be using today have been taken from uh, the series Share It, which is a series by Macmillan Education. And I thought it was a great idea to use this, um, this course because sharing is already a positive trait. So we're already starting with something positive. If you look at the Share It song, you will notice it is also positive. We want to be fair and show we care. All together, we're gonna to make friends. We're sharing the world. We all belong, which is a very important word for a positive classroom, belonging. We share our voices. Voices and choices are very important and sing this song. Um, so 
the, this course really reflects a positive classroom. So I'm going to be using some examples from here. Others are other examples that I've just been thinking about and thought were very useful. So let's start with number one, a positive physical environment. When I think of physical environments, the first thing that comes to mind is the Reggio Emilia approach. If you are familiar with the Reggio Emilia approach, you will know it's, um, it's a philosophy that is Italian. I don't know if we've got any Italians here today. Um, and what stands out in this framework is the physical environment. The Italians in this, uh, that consider this philosophy are fantastic in creating amazing physical environments. It's the Reggio Emilia philosophy. So this comes from the Reggio Emilia philosophy. We value space to create a handsome environment and its potential to inspire social, affective and cognitive learning. The space is an aquarium that mirrors the ideas and values of the people who live in it. The space, the physical environment, mirrors the ideas and the values of the people who live in it. And sometimes we don't think of it like that. Sometimes we're not thinking about the physical environment in that way. Imagine a child who lives in a home that is always disorganized, untidy, messy. What value are those parents teaching to that child? They're teaching the child that it is not important to be tidy and clean and neat. And the same thing happens in the classroom. Look at these pictures. What do these pictures tell you about the values of the teacher, about what the teacher expects from her or his learners? Look at picture number one, the first one with the chairs that are stacked up in the middle. What does this environment tell you about the teacher's attitude? Right, okay. What does the second picture tell you? The one where you have the shelves and all the material on the shelves. What does this tell you that the teacher values? Or she doesn't, or he doesn't value. Okay. So if we have this environment, what are we teaching the children who are in this environment? What values are we teaching them? What beliefs are we expressing? What are we communicating through this? What about the one at the bottom, the one with all the rows and it's quite dark? What, what do you think the teacher is showing through this? It's gloomy, it's sad, it's boring, it's cold. <laughs> Okay, they're individuals. Okay, I'm going to grab that. I like that. They're individuals. And this is something quite interesting to look at. And sometimes we don't think about these things. But when you have your classroom organized in a way in which children come into the classroom and they go and sit at their little desk on their own, what you are expressing is that you value individual work more than collaboration. Now, I'm not saying you don't have to do this, but maybe we can change that seating arrangement at different times. Yes, there's no windows as well. I hadn't noticed that. Um, but we can change the seating arrangement at times so that we have students sitting individually for certain tasks. But we don't want to show that that's the only way of working. We don't want to show that we value individualized instruction and that is how you learn because that is not necessarily how you learn. You learn as social beings, in collaboration, in cooperation. Um, so we need to see what our environments are expressing. Do they clash with our belief system, with our values and the way we want to teach? 
or do they go hand in hand? Do they accompany? Um, when we have seats like this and rows, we're also showing that it's okay to have someone in front of you who might be talking and you can see their back. And it's not important to look at people in the eyes when they're talking. It's okay to just, you know, go ahead and have a talk and you've got someone behind you and you don't need to turn around and look at them or anything. Maybe the person who's speaking isn't even saying anything very interesting anyway. That's what we're showing. Except if we have children sitting in a circle, for example, where we can all see everybody's faces, and we're showing that it's important to see everyone, that eye contact is important, that we look at people and we really, really listen when they're speaking because what they've got to say is important, no matter what they're saying. Okay. Um, what about this picture? What does this picture express from a teacher? I just took any picture. Okay, it could be um, anything you like. But, okay, this shows collaboration, it's bright, everybody can see each other, group work, it's fun, it's attractive. Okay, much better, someone says. Okay, fantastic. Equality, friendly, order, collaborative. All right. So um, it makes a big difference, it really does. What would be your favorite holiday? Picture number one, your favorite de beach destination. Would it be picture number one or would it be picture number two? Where would you go back? <laughs> That's the same in the classroom. It's exactly the same example. Would you go back to that dark classroom in rows or would you go back to that bright classroom where you can work collaboratively? It's exactly the same. Where would you go back to? So a positive physical environment really needs to be orderly and attractive. If we don't have order in our classroom, we can't expect order from our students. The seating arrangement is really important. Yes, number Sonia says number one to pick up the rubbish. Yes, good. That's a, that's a nice way of thinking of it. That's a positive way of thinking of it. Um, seating arrangement is really important because um, it depends how you set this up how students will feel, what type of activities they know that they're gonna be doing or not, how they're gonna be working, what is expected of them and what is valued? Is it valued to be working co collaboratively or is it not? Is it valued to be looking at people when they're speaking or is it not? And remember that walls talk. Sometimes we just think of it as look, have the walls just to look nice, you know, colorful and attractive. But it's not only that, it, it's also ownership. It's also belonging. If students can choose their work to put up onto the walls, that is ownership and that is belonging. And they're walking into a place that is theirs and it's not just created by someone else. Um, we can create posters together with, with our learners so that they have been involved in the creation of that classroom, uh, not just come into something that is totally unknown to them. So the physical environment is really important. Uh, we don't need to go to the extreme of uh, the Reggio Emilia if you don't want to, of course. If you look at pictures of them, they're brilliant. Uh, and the materials they use, that they're, they're all incredible. We don't need to go there because sometimes it's not our context. Sometimes it's not our reality. But do what you can with what you've got. Don't be your own threat. So let's have a little reflection. What is your belief system? That's the first thing you need to think about. Although it doesn't sound like it's got to do with your physical environment, we need to think of what our belief system is first. What do we value? What do we want to communicate? We're giving a message through our physical environment. Does our physical environment reflect this or does it clash with this idea? What does this environment teach those who are in it? Our physical environment teaches, it's teaching something. Perhaps it's not academic necessarily, but it is a place of belonging, a place of achievements, a place of ownership. So it's teaching something. Be tidy, it's not necessary, not necessary to be tidy. Do we look at people when they're talking or don't we look at people when they're talking? They're teaching all that. 
And the last question that I would like you to reflect on is uh, when you think of your classroom, would you want to come back to it? The same as the beach. Would you like to come back to it or not? So I'll leave those, those are food for thought for you. You need to make your walls talk, fantastic. Well, that's a good reflection and a good thing to pinpoint so that you can work on that, wonderful. Um, so let's look at number two. Number two, positive time and instructional management. First things first, let's look at routines. What routines do you use in your classroom? Could you just write a few routines? Um, choosing the helper routine or giving out jobs routine. What routines do you use in your classroom? Helping hands, that's lovely, Christina. Uh, cho choosing the greeting, that's lovely. Sing a song, attendance taking, mistakes a valued chant. Oh, that's really nice, mistakes a valued chant. Playing the weather song, fantastic. So there's lots of routines you can use. In Share It, this course that I mentioned, um, we have a I can routine, which is already positive in its name. I can. Let's see what we can do. And that becomes a routine that we do all the time. At the end of each page, at the bottom, if you can see where it says the page number 44, it says, I can name after school activities. So at the end of each page, your learners, as a routine, are going to check out their achievements with that page in the book. Um, they're going to do this page and then they're going to reflect on their own learning. So it's self-assessment where they have a little bit of feedback from their peer because what they're going to do is not only tick that little box, but you're going to write that on the board. I can name after school activities that they have learned in that section. And they're going to turn to their friend and they're going to say, I can name after school activities. Use the internet do my homework, have a snack, have a nap, da, da, da. and they start naming them. Together, turn taking, they just go and they name them. They name all those that they know. So an I can routine. And we could apply this I can routine to anything you like. I can take turns. I can work collaboratively. I can, it can be anything you like. So you can adapt this to the social and emotional development if you want to as well. So it's not just the ac academic achievements that we want to look at, although we do want to look at those as well, of course, but you can always adapt it. So it's really important to um, allow them to have that feeling, that I can feeling. That brings well-being, that brings positiveness, and they know what they're learning as well. But don't only think of routines at the beginning of your lesson or after one page in the book, but also at the end of the day as an exit pass. Again, the same thing when they're leaving the classroom. Of course, it depends on your reality and your context and if this can be done or not. Um, but when they leave the classroom, they can always give you, give me two after school activities. So they can leave the classroom by giving you those after two, those, uh, two after school activities. Um, and that also gives them that boost in confidence. I can do this. Um, so to leave the classroom, they need to give you that. But it could also be to leave the classroom, tell me what you enjoyed about today. So to leave the classroom, they need to tell you that. It was the game, the song, it was um, uh, being able to work in their groups, etc. So you have different ways of including routines. It's not just the routine that you do at the beginning of your lesson. Include routines all the time. Why? Because it brings familiarity. It's predictable. All these routines, that's why routines are used, because of their familiarity and their predictability. And students know what to expect. They feel safe. There's security. Um, related to routines, we have safe procedures as well. We want them to be safe. So anything you do that is not exactly a routine, but you do repeat often, like read to self procedure read to self or clean up time. Perhaps you don't do it all the time, but you do it every two days or uh, you do it once a week if you're reading to yourself. Um, 
if they're not exactly routines, but you want them to become procedures that your students know, they know how to carry out very well, and they're safe about it. They need to have that feeling of being safe. We can make anchor charts. For example, these that you've got on the screen. And you create these anchor charts together. You don't just do it yourself. And already having this as a poster that will go on the wall um, helps rather than saying, OK, we're going to read to yourself now. So choose a book, sit by yourself, stay in one spot, read quietly. If you do that, it's not safe enough. We need to make sure they know exactly what is expected. Otherwise, you're going to start telling them off. I said stay in one spot and you're moving around. So then when another child hears that, their anxiety level is going to go up. What if I don't do one of those things that I was supposed to do? What if I forget one of those things that she just said and I didn't really listen to what she was saying? I'm not sure whether I listened or I didn't. I, we don't want that confusion and that anxiety. They need to feel safe, know what is expected. So come everybody, what we're gonna do when we read to ourselves, we sit in a circle with them or as a class procedure. Okay, what do we need to do first? First, we need to choose a book. Yes, good, so choose a book. What do we need to do? Where do we sit? Do we sit in a group because we're gonna read all together or no, we sit by ourselves because this is reading to ourselves. Are we going to uh, read it out loud? Oh no, we're gonna read it quietly. So you write that. So you create it with them so that they take ownership of these procedures. They have written these procedures with you. It's not just rules that you give to them. Okay, so writing it down with them is important. You've got it there for them to be able to refer back to in case of wondering, hmm, how did this procedure go? And they'll know what it is. Also, mirror words. Um, this is a whole brain teaching technique. And what you do is you want to involve your learners in mirroring these procedures or the rules that you have or the routines. So what you say is mirrors out. So your students bring their mirrors out. And this means they're gonna mirror what you do and what you say. Choose a book. So they repeat, choose a book. Sit by yourself. They repeat, sit by yourself. Stay in one spot, stay in one spot. Read quietly, read quietly. Mirrors down. So you take mirrors out, you pay to put your mirrors down. Um, they become involved in the learning of these procedures. You don't say, did you understand? They all say, yes. And then you have no idea what can happen. You get them involved in acting out these procedures one by one. So you do mirror words. Um, all right. We want learners to know what they're supposed to be learning. For positive classrooms, to have positive results, we need them to know what the goals are, what that positive result is. So. We can ask them also with procedures or with goals to turn and talk. That means talk to your partner. So I will say to you, for example, all right, today we're going to learn about positive time and instructional management. We're going to look at routines, safe procedures and achievement goals. And then I'll say, teach or teach or teach, do it whatever way you want. And your learners will respond by saying, okay, or okay, or okay. They turn to their partner and they say, today we're going to learn about positive time and instructional management, routines, safe procedures and achievement goals. And they take turns saying it. Okay, so the idea is that they become involved in what they're going to learn and that they can communicate this. They can communicate what they're going to learn. And that is positive. 
We don't want them to be lost in all the things that are happening in the classroom. We want them to know what they're gonna be learning about. Once they've learned that, they're also going to tell their partner what they have learned at the end of the lesson. So we'll go, teach, and they'll go, okay. And they'll teach their partner about what they've learned. So this is an ongoing process where they're talking to each other, they're communicating the goals, and they communicate what they can do at the end of the lesson as well. In Share It, we also have at the end of the units, games that review what they have learned. And this is, again, in an another way to, um, to see what they have achieved and see their successes, which is a wonderful thing for your students. And if you see at the end, it says, I can use the language in unit four. So again, they have their I can statement at the end of that. That's their progress tracker. Um, confidence building steps when we're teaching certain language, we need them to be uh, have a feeling of confidence, self-esteem. Um, we want to uh, make sure that they're safe again. Uh, that they're confident enough to use the language and that they know what the lang what language they have to use. I have um, seen lessons where teachers, for example, have a box and they have different items inside the box and the student has to come put their hand inside the box, feel something in there and say what they think it is. Now, a learner might come, put their hand in there, and say, mm, okay, it's round, uh, it's a ball. Okay, maybe it's an apple, which is also round, or maybe it's something else that is also round. If we don't have any previous step to that game, where they're totally blind about what is inside that box, anything could happen. They could say any word they like. And they might be wrong if they say any word they like. But if we give them a context, if they know what's coming up, they will probably be right. And we want to help our learners to be right. We want to help them to be successful without giving them the answer, of course, but let's help them to become successful because that is positive. Um, so previous steps are important or contexts. So if we do a game before this, or we pre-teach certain language, or we do a quick song about fruit and vegetable, it will be easier for our learners to understand that probably inside that box we'll make the connection, and there's probably going to be fruit and vegetables inside there, not toys, for example. So they need to know what's coming up. They need to know that goal. What are we learning right now? Or we have an SOS board where we review the language needed for the game. It's your turn. It's my turn. That's not right. That's correct. That's not correct. Or what's missing? And have an SOS board. You have a board. You have a part of the board that um, with a frame around it that says SOS. So it's a help board. And you have all that language that your learners will need to play that game so that they feel safe and they know what language they have to use. That is confidence building. If we just throw them in the deep end, anything can happen. Voice and choice. Allow your learners, when possible, to think of what they would like to learn, projects, make it relevant for them, make it meaningful, where they want to learn, in the classroom, sitting at desks on the floor. There was a study um, that was done in Sweden and they did this study with children from six years of age to 16. And it turns out they none of them wanted to, or very, very few wanted to work at tables, sitting on their chair with their books. Most of them wanted to sit on the floor and put their backs against a wall. That's how they wanted to learn, sitting on the floor with their backs against a wall. Um, so if it's possible, why not let them choose where, if it's possible, of course. Who are they going to work with? Maybe give them jobs or roles. So you have a facilitator. You have a time manager who is looking at the time, seeing if they're on, on, on time. Um, and I really like this idea of choice boards. Um, I have to thank Vicky Salmel 
some of you might know her. She's a teacher trainer in Argentina. And Vicky Saumel uh, talked about this idea of choice boards. This is a vocabulary choice board. So your learners will decide how they want to learn. Will they sort their vocabulary words into three categories? The more creative the category is, the better. Words can be sorted by meaning, letters, vowels, syllables, etc. That's in the middle. Or will they make a comic strip using 10 of the words? Or will they uh, draw a picture to show the meaning of at least 10 vocabulary words? This can be used in class at the end of a lesson. You perhaps have 10 minutes at the end of the lesson, so let them choose how they want to review these vocabulary words. It can be used as homework. You could say you need to do three by the end of the week or three by the end of the month if you give them homework. Um, they can be done, um, they can be used by fast finishers. They can be used for vocabulary, for grammar, for STEAM activities, art, whatever you like, not only vocabulary. And you can also create um, tic-tac-toe choice boards, so, or noughts and crosses choice boards. So that means that they have to do three in a row. So they have to choose three that they like, but they're in a row, either horizontally, vertically, or diagonally. Um, so this is quite a nice idea for choice. And choice brings empowerment. It's different for them to be told, do this, than to be asked, which of these would you like to do? They're still doing it, they're still being involved with the language, they're still learning it, but it's a different approach to asking them to do something. And what about ending a lesson? We usually think about beginning a lesson, beginning a lesson on a high note and routines and getting them going and warm ups, but what happens at the end of the lesson? End your lesson on a high note. We want them to want to come back. In uh, Pre-primary, with the very, very younger ones, we usually dance with ribbons or something like that so that they enjoy the end of the lesson and they want to come back the next day. Um, with children in primary school, we can use technology, which is something that is relevant for them, like a Kahoot wrap-up quiz. If you're not familiar with Kahoot, you go into the website and you'll see you can create quizzes with Kahoot. You can have a snowball fight where uh, your learners will write a question or something about the day or a challenge, say five after school activities. So they crunch it up in a little ball and they throw it. They have a snowball fight. After 30 seconds, you say, stop. You've got to get one of those, open it up and tell their partner five um, after school activities, whatever they have there. So they throw them again, get another piece of paper until the bell rings and it's time to go home. Um, Cliffhanger, give them something to think about so that they want to come back the next day. Hold back the answer to an important question and say, okay, I'm gonna tell you tomorrow. Um, you can always uh, listen to a song, teach them one section of a song and say, you're not giving them the title. I'm giving you the title tomorrow. If you can find out the title of this song by tomorrow, something, whatever, uh, celebrate in whatever way you like. We'll talk about celebrations and rewards later. Um, or give them a riddle. I'm gonna give you a riddle for a positive classroom. Why does the teacher wear sunglasses when she or he comes to class? This is the riddle again. Why does the teacher wear sunglasses when she or he comes to class? All right, don't tell me any answers. You're going to hear the answer and you can come with your own answer to our next webinar, which is in four hours. No, I'm joking. Uh, but that's what you would do in the classroom. You would say uh, the answer we will talk about tomorrow. So you can go home thinking about this and they will come in willing to give you the answer to that riddle. OK, because his or her students are so bright. Yes, Isabel. Yes, good. Um, so we've got high expectations for our students. Let's reflect. Do my learners feel safe? Do they know how routines are carried out? Do they know the procedures? Are they clear? Have they practiced them? Have they done the mirroring first? Do children know what they're learning, what the achievement goals are? And do I offer opportunities for feeling of empowerment? Do they have a voice? 
do they have choice in my classroom? Which was the first two that we looked at? We looked at the ingredient number one was, what was ingredient number one? Physical environment. What was ingredient number two? Time and instructional management, good. Number three, behavior management. We love starting our year with our rules, don't we? And we write them all on the board like Mrs. Muttner does. She goes over a few of her rules on the first day of school. No smiling, no sweating, no sneezing, no coughing, no coming in late, no coming in early, okay, etc. No living, yes. And if you've seen Michael Rosen's poem, No Breathing in class, have a look at that on YouTube. It's fantastic. Now, how would students feel if they get this? That's not very nice, is it? Um, so let's change our rules around a little bit. Many times we do get the idea of creating rules or thinking about our rules in our books. So in this case, we would look at our rules, listen to the audios, point to the rules. Um, but then what we want is for them to create a pledge, which is an interesting idea. So they're going to promise that they're going to do something, right? Um, they take turns individually standing up and reading their sentences aloud saying, I promise to be respectful, kind, and responsible, for example, and they sign it. And they can sign the board or a poster if you like as well. But the interesting thing would be after talking about different types of rules or responsibilities is to get them to create their own rules or responsibilities as well. So think about that. And the way we get them to think about that is uh, to conclude that we need to treat others in the same way that we like to be treated. Um, so think about how you would like to be treated first. That's a good way to start thinking about rules. Um, and think about, uh, it's interesting to get them involved in this as well. So work out a mime for that classroom habit or that classroom rule or responsibility. And usually when we're talking about positive classrooms, we talk about responsibilities rather than rules because rules come from an outsider. It's very top down. So we prefer to call them responsibilities, really. It's your responsibility to take turns. It's your responsibility to be kind. It's your responsibility to clean up. It's your responsibility to raise your hand. That's the responsibilities that we have. However, we tend to try to use we. We. We're all involved in this. We're all in this together. Okay? It's our responsibility to raise our hand. It's our responsibility to clean up. We're all in this together. Um, it's not the same for your uh, boss to come and say, the rules are these, and you must follow the rules if your boss comes to tell you something like that. Now, if your, your boss comes and says, these are your responsibilities, or this is your job description, it makes a big difference than if your boss says, these are the rules. Um, so we want to describe expected behavior, make sure they really understand it. The same thing happened with the procedures. We need to make it safe. If we say, be polite, what does it mean? It means smiling, it means holding the door, it, look, it means looking at who's talking. What does it sound like? Good morning, nice job, can I help you? That's what being polite sounds like and that's what it looks like, make it clear to them. Um, there is also whole body listening. When we say listen, everyone listen, listen to Claire, she's talking now. What is listen? Listen means using the whole body. It means looking at the person who's speaking, it means not tapping on the table with your fingers. It means staying still. It means uh, thinking, using your brain to think about what the person's saying. That is thinking. Using your ears to listen, but also closing your mouth so that you're not interrupting. That's whole body listening. You use your whole body to listen, not just your ears. Um, we build a sense of community by uh, creating rules together. And there, we can always have recognition items and activities. Now be careful with recognition items. That means stickers and stamps and um, little you know, uh, uh, rewards, stars and happy faces and things like that. Uh, if we use them too much, 
then uh, learners tend to be good or follow that responsibility for the sake of getting that reward rather than because it is the correct thing to do. So what we want to do, if we do give out stars or stamps, uh, we always want to ask, how did that make you feel when you did that action? Okay, it's the action, it's the feeling of well-being that we want to make explicit, not necessarily the sticker or the star. And catch them being good, catch them being good, CVG. Uh, try to catch them as many times being good rather than being bad. Be positive about your classroom management. And we also like to call classroom management culture, really. So we're creating a, a positive culture rather than managing our learners, because again, that is top down. Um, have a praise checklist. Make sure that you praise everyone and praise everyone for something real, real that they've done. Not just, oh, good job. But actually, okay, what exactly are you saying good job about? What did this child actually do? Yes, catch them being good. All right, um, attention grubbers. Use attention grubbers for your cl for your classroom management. Um, what's the answer to Scooby Dooby Doo? If I say Scooby Dooby Doo, what do you answer? Where are you? Yes. So, uh, attention grabbers, I say Scooby Dooby Doo, students say, where are you? And that grabs their attention. Hands on top, everybody stop, or that means stop. If you can hear my voice, clap three times. If you can hear my voice, clap two times. If you can hear my voice, clap one time. Or a non-verbal signal. Put your hand up and just wait for everyone to copy, putting their hands up until everybody's with you. Sometimes you need non-verbal sig uh, signals because if you're outside, outdoors, or lots of other children there, uh, sometimes it's better to have a non-verbal signal than to be shouting out loud. Um, have power breaks and brain breaks. Show that you care. Show that you know it's difficult to concentrate for a long period of time. Jump five times. Uh, walk around the classroom four times. Clap three times. Give your friend two high fives or whatever, and then they get back to work again. Show that you know how they learn. Show that you know how the brain works and that they need a rest sometimes. They can do some breathing. You've got a flower here. Look, this is my beautiful flower. Mine is red, what color is yours? And I have some candles here. I've got five candles. One, two, three, four, five candles. I'm going to smell my flower and blow out the candles. Look, now this one's my flower and these are the candles. I'm gonna smell my, can my flower. And blow out the candles. I'm breathing. I could also say breathe in, breathe out, but it makes it different to younger children to be able to see what they're doing. I'm actually smelling it and I'm actually blowing it out. Um, so let's reflect. Have we got positive shared responsibility? If they need to be shared, we need to talk about them with our students and think about what they want to share. Do they understand how to carry out each responsibility? Is it clear? Do you try to catch them being good? And do you have favorite attention grabbers and power breaks? Okay, our last section, and I'm running out of time now, so I'm rushing. Uh, teacher effectiveness. Don't be your own threat. And this is the frightening conclusion. I have come to the frightening conclusion that I am the decisive element. It is my personal approach that creates the climate. It is my daily mood that makes the weather. I possess tremendous power to make life miserable or joyous. I can be a tool of torture or an instrument of inspiration. I can humiliate or humor, hurt or heal. In all situations, it is my response that decides whether a crisis is escalated or de-escalated, and a person is humanized or dehumanized. What is it that makes us 
uh, create life to be joyous instead of miserable? Or what can we do to be an instrument of inspiration rather than a tool of torture, etc.? It's us. It's powerful, isn't it? It's deep. Yes. Um, so let's look at us. Look at yourself. What are your teacher traits? What are your characteristics, your attitudes, your values? Be a role model for that. Um, look at your students' assets as well. We need to be asset building. We show our own assets, but also what are your, your learners' assets? Making a pegboard, you see that picture there? A pegboard is a really nice idea for connectedness. We want our learners to feel connected all together. Um, have them write I can statements. You know those I can statements that we've been looking at that have become routines? I can do this or that. Or I am good at English. I like reading. Write a statement, a positive statement about yourself that is an asset of yours. Um, you put it on a cork board and you have drawing pins. You put one drawing pin with each of these statements that your students have written. And then you get yarn or string and you have them connect their own assets with the assets of others. If I'm also good at English, I will put my string on that drawing pin, uh, wrap it around the drawing pin. If I like reading too, I will wrap it around that drawing pin. So we're connecting all our learners' assets together. Um, greet them on their way in. You have different ways of greeting. Somebody mentioned this morning greeting choices. Acknowledge each child, know that they're there, build positive relationships. Get to know them as much as you can. Look at them in the eyes and sit down with them at their level. Um, and at the end of the day as well, don't forget about the end of the day. It's one of the most important moments in the day. Uh, end the day on positive experiences. You did this really well today before they leave out, the, they go out the door. Um, when you have activities in your course book, for example, Matt is the tallest, Jake is taller than Richard, where you're teaching all that language. Um, what we want to do is also get our learners to do it themselves. So this is the last, so they get to know each other. So this is the last reflection we have today. Think of your positive teacher traits that you think you have. Which ones would you like to develop that you think you, you need to develop? And ask yourself, do you humanize? Which is a big, big question. So these are the four ingredients that we looked at within each one of these ingredients we had lots of different examples and lots of different practical ideas that i hope have been useful so the last thing i want to ask you is what is one of these ideas or one piece of advice that you would give to a future teacher about creating his or her own positive classroom which is one idea or piece of advice that you would give to a future teacher. Be yourself, lovely, smile, be patient, build rapport with your students, empathy, be positive, create a positive environment, humanize, be nice, be kind, calm, cooperative, lovely, Okay, lovely, lovely ideas. And the last piece of advice that I would give to you is, um, is to um, think of these positive environments, reflect on your positive environment. It takes time to build it. And don't worry if you have not started building it yet. It's never too late to start. And think of it as an investment. Don't rush things. Don't hurry to get to your test to teach to the test. Um, make sure that you're working on your positive environment because it is an investment that you really, really want to make. I hope this has been useful and positive for your teaching. Do your learners want to come back is a big question that you want to ask yourselves after every lesson. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for your participation. You've been lovely. Um, I'm sorry, it, I've been, a, taking a bit longer than I thought I was going to take, but I just wanted to give you lots of ideas. So I hope these have been useful. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much. I hope you can really use these ideas in your classroom. Thank you. So, Sarah, can you hear me? Yes, Mike. Me? Hello. Hi, yeah. So, Sarah, thanks a million for the great um, uh, session. Uh, we had hundreds of teachers here from all around the world, all leaving this session feeling very positive. So, mm -hmm. with a with an extra um, smile on their faces. Uh, as they go back into their classrooms. Um, so a big thank you to you, Sarah. And I'd like to say a big thank you to Federica, who works here and who does all of the hard work behind uh, the webinars uh, and, and is a shining example of, of how being positive can bring positive results. And a big thank you, and I'm sure you'll join me, Sarah, as well, in thanking all of the teachers who've joined us we understand how busy you are, and we know just looking at where you're from, that some of you are probably watching this before you've even had your breakfast, some of you are watching it in the middle of the night, and we really appreciate that um, every time we offer a webinar, you join us in such uh, great numbers. And uh, we can tell from the chat box as well that you really pay attention during the session. So um, not just great teachers, but great students as well. So a big thank you. <laughs>